If you're in construction, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the Constructed Behaviors Podcast. I'm your host, Barb Allen. I'm a woman with decades of experience in the construction industry, and most of it on the job site. I know how rewarding this industry can be, but like you, I also know that we could improve. Let's work together to make changes from the inside out. Do you ever get tired of explaining the struggles that women face in the construction industry, especially when it is to people who don't seem to want to hear it? People who think you are just complaining again and that most other women are not having the same experience in construction. Well, today, I have a guest that is here to help us with that. Tim Taylor is the Director of Research at NCCER, which is the National Center for Construction Education and Research. Tim led a study for NCCER aimed at highlighting and educating the industry on the struggles women are facing in construction today. Tim and I met when he was giving a presentation titled In Her Own Words at the annual conference for the National Association of Women in Construction last month. And I will admit that myself, along with many other women at the conference, were attracted by the presentation title and yet skeptical and curious as to why a man was going to give that presentation to a group of women. But after hearing the presentation and getting to know Tim a bit more, I'm really glad that he did and that he shared the information with us. So Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Barb. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's start about um, having you tell the listeners the purpose of NCCER, because I had never heard of them until uh, sitting in your presentation. Sure. So NCCER is an educational nonprofit. Uh, We develop uh, curriculum and training programs for about 40 different uh, construction trades. Uh, So that would include the textbooks uh, for if you want to be an electrician or a carpenter and at at all different levels, uh, we develop those materials. Um, But then we also have our industry credential uh, certification program, which is when you complete uh, one of our training modules, and then if you you know complete them in order similar to like a, uh, earning a, an undergraduate degree, uh, you would be awarded an, an NCCER certification, which is um, a, a number that is sort of assigned to you. And if you apply for a job, uh, a, an employer could go in, type your number into uh, into our database system, and it would pull up. Not only the training that you received, uh, but our certified workers, we also have performance verification where, you know, somebody on the job site goes through and, you know, verifies that the individual can apply what they learned in the classroom uh, on the job site. Uh, we don't, we do not do any training ourselves. Our materials are basically turnkey training solutions that are used by high schools, community colleges, contractors, third-party training organizations, uh, basically, anybody that's involved with skilled construction training uh, is is our that's our really our core business, uh, and we have been in business uh, since uh, the mid 1990s. Awesome. Um, I had I had no idea that you guys did all of that. So, what is your role within NCCER? Yes. Yeah, so my role within NCCER is really the the last part of our name, uh, which is the research aspect. Um, So NCCER, since its founding, has been involved in research related to uh, the skilled construction trade. Um, So that could be, uh, you know, looking at ways to improve worker productivity, uh, looking at ways to, you know, really improve construction craft training, uh, quantifying what are the benefits of a a trained and and highly skilled construction craft, craft workforce, um, and also, you know, looking at problems like what uh, what causes uh, skilled trade shortages, uh, like our industry has, has been experiencing, um, mm-hmm. pretty severe level for the past fifteen to twenty years. Uh, and then this particular project, which is is looking at how um, uh, women's uh, the experience of women involved in the construction trades. So, how did you get into this? Is your background in research, or is you do you have a construction background? Uh, so yes, 
So I was uh, literally born into the construction industry. Uh, my grandfather had the purse, first piece of motorized equipment, construction equipment, um, in the county that I grew up in, in Kentucky. Um, so cool. he started off with a team of mules moving dirt and then got a, 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 a you know, uh, Alice Chalmers, uh, a Caterpillar tractor type machine. My family was in the excavation business. So that's what I grew up doing. Uh, and then uh, I went to uh, school uh, for civil engineering. Uh, and so I, you know, I finished up my civil engineering degree, oh, worked in the industry that way. And then eventually I was a college professor at the University of Kentucky in civil engineering. And my main research area was in workforce development. So the, the, I've, I've got kind of a background in both. Everything has has set you up for the position that you're in right now. I think that's fantastic. And I feel the same with my career. Like I wasn't sure where it was going to go and where it, where it came from led to where I am. And I, I love that. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's let's dive into the study. Uh, it's titled In Her Own Words. This is a research study that you guys did. Tell the audience what was the purpose of the study? What motivated the research? Sure. So, you know, my my main research area and NCCER's research area um, for a very long time has just been sort of skilled workforce shortages and looking at solutions, um, you know, to that shortage. Um, and, and there's really, uh, you know, as, as part of that work, <clears throat> you start to look and see, you know, there's the needs of the industry, you know, large companies, you know, we need to get projects built, we need to get um, um, projects executed um, you know, to really to, to better society. And so that's one side of it. But the other side of it is the benefit to the individual of a, of a good career in construction, you know, construction mm -hmm. trades, uh, highly skilled, you can earn a good wage. And not only can you earn a good wage, you can have a good career. You know, if um, you can come in, uh, you know, just, just like you did, uh, you know, come in at a, at a, uh, in an entry level trade position and work your way up uh, into leadership roles. And so we had really been looking at how do we sort of make these opportunities more available to, um, you know, non-traditional people. One of the challenges that the construction industry has, um, it, in, in some ways it's good, in some ways it's a challenge, but most people that work in construction, if you ask them what got you into it, uh, family would, would, would come in, you know, would come into that picture. Uh, so that's great. Uh, that's, that's great for an industry, but what happens if, if, uh, you don't have a background in construction and That's you're trying right. to get into the construction industry. So that was just sort of a broader topic that we've been looking on for the past few years. Well, then, you know, when we look at the opportunity, both to companies and to individuals, you know, women in the construction trades is something that really came up. You know, women are 50.5% of the population, uh, the latest census data, uh, but they're only 14% of the construction industry overall. And if you drill down and look at the construction trades, it's less than 4%. Right. So um, we, we, that was what really spurred us to look onto that, but not only from a numbers standpoint, but our CEO, you know, was also very intentional about women bring unique skills, gifts, qualities uh, that we miss out on with a predominantly male workforce. Right. Um, before I ask my next question about the study, I just want to say something you gave in your presentation, um, and I'm not going to remember the numbers exactly, but it was a statistic about what college graduates are on average making uh, versus what the skilled trades are making on their in their first year. Any chance you happen to remember those numbers? Sure, I can get them. I can get them close enough to to what we're uh, to, for what our conversation awesome. is. So. If you look at the median um, starting salary for um, four year people with four year college degrees, so you know any any four year college degree, that median salary uh, is forty seven thousand dollars a year. Um, if you look at um, so NCCER every year uh, we collect uh, wage data. Uh, for what does a skilled craft professional um, make? And we collect that information from companies. Uh, and then if if we get an hourly wage, and then if we annualize that, uh, the, the median construction craft salary uh, wage uh, was $63,000 a year. Wow. And that is, th that does not include overtime. Uh, that mm -hmm. does not include 
uh, you know, any of the other, you know, per diem benefits that you may come in and see. So, you know, from a, from an annual salary standpoint, there is a, there is a difference there. Um, you know, we are, um, supportive of people furthering their education and there's many different ways to do that, but yes, that's yeah. the, that's the statistic, um, that, that we've, that we have together on that. Well, and I think what's interesting is I, I like the, the statistic about, all four-year degrees, the average being $47,000, $48,000. Because, you know, here in Kansas City, I know that when we were reviewing resumes to hire out of college for construction, construction-related degrees, they're coming in about 70. And that alone, telling people, like, you're, if, if you want to get a degree, you can make $40,000 somewhere, or you can make $70,000 your first year in construction. But looking at the numbers that you have, it's, 70,000 with a degree, which you have debt from, or 63,000 going right in and starting making that that first year. And I just think the money, so many people are not really looking at the money. And um, I think I think a lot of people out there don't realize construction people make this the kind of money that we do. And I'll tell a quick story that I may delete from this recording later. But when I was, um, shoot, I was probably seven years in, seven years into my career, and I was doing a job, Mira Coles, and my mom wanted these diamond earrings for Christmas or something, and Coles had them, and they were on sale, so I went into Coles right after work one day to buy these earrings, and they weren't super expensive, but they were real, and um, I walked up to the counter in my construction attire, and the woman did not want to help me. And then when she finally did, I told her what I wanted to see. She says, those are expensive. And I was like, okay, I'd still like to see them. And then I saw them and I bought them and I'm standing there thinking, lady, you have no idea. I probably make two to three times more than what you make, but you don't like my outfit. Like, I just think people don't realize what we are out there making. So sorry to totally tangent on that. I will get back to the survey. <laughs> Actually, that actually ties into to some of the, the work that we've been doing, and I'll, I'll do this briefly. So the, the first one is, um, you know, that experience reflects one of the challenges in getting people into the skilled trades is, you know, the law of supply and demand says that if you have a shortage and your wages go up, then, you know, more people will come in to address that issue. And that's not really happening in construction. And so, you know, what we see is there's some societal pressures there that are hindering that, you know, just like what you talked about, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you make if society sort of views you as a, you know, as, as a, as a failure, because, you know, your, 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 your boots happen to be dirty from your work. That's right. You know, that's a challenge that come that can come into that. The other piece in there that I think is, um, you know, also really important to highlight um, that wage and salary is there and it, it, it is good. Um, and, and some young people, you know, it, it gets a little bit conflicting. Some young people are really interested in that. Um, but what seems to be almost universal among young people now is a desire to really give back to their communities. Um, we've seen that in, in survey and survey that we've done with young people. And so, I mean, that's literally what construction has been doing for thousands of years is, is yeah. making our communities a better place. Uh, and, and people, uh, in addition to not knowing about the salary uh, and the benefits of that, there's also sort of this lack of understanding of, you know, what we do and, and how it benefits society. That's right. That's right. Okay, going back to my questions to, to set the audience up for the survey. So who was surveyed for that research um, in her own words? And when was it done? And how were those participants chosen? I say okay. chosen in in quotes. I don't know that they were handpicked, but you know what I'm asking. Sure. So uh, what we wanted to do with this um, work, uh, we actually used a focus group research methodology here. So in a focus group, um, uh, we would get six to eight uh, tradeswomen together 
Uh, and we would spend about an hour with them. We had a series of questions. Uh, we had 12 questions that we would go through um, with them. And we would just ask them those questions, and then we would record their responses. Um, uh, you know, in addition to taking notes, we had audio recording that would go on. Uh, so we would do that uh, six to eight uh, women at a time within a focus group. Um, I had a facilitator, as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, about the experience at NAWIC, uh, you know, a, a guy there talking about uh, the experience of women in construction industry. <laughs> Uh, I had a lady that helped me, uh, Dr. Mitty Cannon. Uh, she is a um, uh, originally an electrician, has worked her way up. She does construction training now, and she's really passionate about women in the construction trades. And so she actually did the focus groups, uh, uh, did the facilitating for us. We were just there doing the recording. Um, we did that. Uh, we ended up talking with 176 tradeswomen. Wow. Uh, we talked to, uh, we visited, we, we basically did that by visiting either projects or company locations. Um, so we worked with companies that would be willing to host us on their project site. Um, and so, you know, part of, um, part of that was the companies had to have enough women um, that were, that they had to have enough trades women uh, for it to be worthwhile that we could come in and do these focus groups with them. So these were companies that have been actively working on this for a number of years. Um, in terms of, you know, who participated within that, uh, I mentioned we had people in the U.S. and Canada that we talked with. Uh, we had people that worked in industrial construction and commercial construction. Uh, we had a very wide variety um, of both uh, the age of the women and their years of experience in the construction industry. Some of them have been in the industry for 20 years. Uh, some of them have been in the industry for six months. Um, we had some groups, uh, focus groups that we did um, where uh, we had to have a translator because the, uh, they were done in Spanish. Um, so we were able to get, uh, you know, diversity in terms of that. Uh, we had a great deal of racial diversity, ethnic diversity. Uh, also, uh, we were not trade specific. Uh, we talked to, um, you know, many different trades uh, across both industrial and construction. And uh, we also had um, both open shop and union uh, uh, union members that we that participated in the focus groups. That's great. So there were there were 176, I think you said, of women that you interviewed in person. Now there was another part of a, a survey that went out that was like over 700 people responded to. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, we also had a survey effort where. We worked uh, with a group called Ambition Theory, which is a women's leadership um, um, consultant. And uh, with them, we did the, 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 the focus groups that we did, those were only with tradeswomen. Uh, the survey that we sent out with uh, in conjunction with Ambition Theory, that was at women at all different levels uh, of the construction industry. So we had tradeswomen that participated in that survey, but we also had uh, superintendents, foremans, um, project managers, engineers, accountants, HR, marketing, um, executive leadership. And with that survey, we had a 770 uh, responses to that survey effort. Great. So you gathered all this information. What year was the, what, what year, years was the survey taking place? Uh, so the survey took place um, at the, you know, January and February of 2023. Uh, okay. So you know, this year, the focus groups were done over the summer of 2022. Okay. So, so the listeners here, this is real today data. This isn't from 2016. This, this is from now. So I love that. Okay. So um, I'm assuming that up until this point, you hadn't done a lot of internal thinking about women and their struggles in construction and them in, spe in specific. So as you as you started to get this data, was there something in particular that just surprised you with what you saw coming in for responses or heard? Yeah. So um, first, uh, just sort of a, a minor point of clarification there. Um, I, I loved what you said about, you know, this is we were providing a voice to people, you know, to try to get this information shared, to, to, to share that out, um, you know, across the industry. Um, NCCER. Um, our workforce 
within our organization is 60% uh, women. And so, you know, I think we had some insight into that and we had some, um, both the men and the women within the industry, we had some ideas about what those experiences might be and what some of the barriers might be, but we really needed to back it up with some, some scientific analysis. So that's really what prompted us to go out. You know, I think what was, um, what really jumped out at, at both me and Dr. Mitty Cannon when we went through and started to um, um, collect this data, I, I told you a few moments ago about the diversity that we had within these groups. What amazed us was the consistency in the responses to each of the questions. Um, you know, wow. whether we were in the U.S. or Canada, you know, we were, we were, you know, we, we had 176 women um, that, that shared with us and that's, we were really glad to get that experience. But, you know, honestly, if we had stopped after the first group of six to eight women, um, it, it, we would have had many of the same results. Uh, if, if, if you understand what I mean there, just that consistency yeah. that across that, um, you know, I think that was, uh, that was one that, that really jumped out at us. And, you know, there were other moments that jumped out as well, but I think one of the things that, sort of the, one of the more overarching things was um, the the um, helping the men that the women worked with sort of understand, um, you know, what their experiences were. And, um, you know, that, 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 you know, there is discrimination and harassment came up, you know, that was, that was the main barrier that was identified there. And, you know, there were some there were some women that shared incidents um, that are what we generally think of when we think of discrimination and harassment. But what they what they talked about, I want to say almost equally as much as is more of the subtle or the overt or the unintended um, type of stuff that would come up. And that was, um, you know, things like, hey, their male colleagues saying, hey, that's heavy. Let me pick that up for you so you don't get hurt or, hey, that job's really hard you know, let me, let me do that for you so that, so that you don't have to do that. You know, the, the women shared that, you know, for the most part, they understood that their male colleagues were, you know, largely trying to be helpful. Um, and so they weren't trying to prevent them from doing their job. But from the women's right. perspective, that was keeping them from learning their trade. It was also, you know, implying that, you know, I'm not as good at this as you are. Um, and so denying them sort of that learning opportunity. And I think that's something, that's a message that can come out that can companies can kind of look at and say, hey, this is, you know, yes, the, 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 more, uh, the more overt, uh, you know, sexual harassment, there's no place for that. There's no tolerance for it. It's got to get addressed. But this was sort of that next level um, to, to start looking at. Um, yeah. And I, in my very first podcast episode, I talk on this a bit about um, in my, I was an, an laborer for an internship before I graduated college. And the biggest thing I remember that summer is being able to carry my first sheet of three quarter inch plywood, a full four by eight sheet of three quarter inch plywood, being able to carry that on my own. I'm like, hell yeah, I got this, you know, right. but how many times up to then people would say, hey, can I get that for you? Or, hey, let me get that. And something that I want listeners to hear is, I don't think anyone should stop saying, would you like help with that? I think instead we should be saying it to everyone. I think from a safety perspective, it's safer for two people to carry a piece of plywood than for one, especially on a windy day. But I think that there are there are so many different body types, so many different age groups out there that we should just be using the phrase to everyone, would you like help with that? Not let me get it because it does feel demeaning. It does feel demoralizing. It just feels like, oh, you think I can't do my job, but instead ask me, ask him, ask anybody, would you like help with that? Or can I help you with that? Or, hey man, I got a minute. I'd like to help you if you don't mind. You know, like that is important for us to do industry-wide. Yes. And so one of the building on that, uh, in addition to talking with the, the women, the tradeswomen, uh, we also did some focus groups with some of the site management, um, uh, you know, the, the, the project managers, the, the superintendents uh, on the site. And we asked them, you know, most of them were men. And so we asked them questions very similar to what we asked the women. And, you know, one of those um, site managers made the point, you know, 
we're not trying to, we don't do construction anymore based on human muscle power. You know, we do it using mechanical power, hydraulic power, electric power. Um, you know, we have got equipment and machines out here to do this work, you know. And so he pointed out to me that the women are the ones that actually, you know, do the projects as we design them to be done because, you know, a guy may be able to, able to wrestle, you know, one pipe into place um, through their own physical strength. But as you say, um, you not only are you more at risk for getting hurt, um, you're also likely less productive if you use the, the the piece of lifting equipment that's been provided there where you can move, you know, six pipe instead of one at the same time. And that was something that came out in our focus groups uh, when we talked with the women quite a bit. So you said something a minute ago. Um that uh, what I wrote down from it is most women are having the same experiences in construction. And, you know, that ties to what I said in the intro about we, we get tired of having to explain to people what our struggles were. And we honestly do get the feedback like, well, not everyone's facing that. Okay, not everyone is, but most women and your study proves that most women in construction are facing similar things. So thinking that this woman at your company is just being difficult, it is industry-wide that women are facing this. And I, I, I love hearing that within the first even focus group that you sat down at, you could have stopped there and basically got the same answers. I think that's really, really important for people to hear. And, um, you know, I, I have been asked or told um, I just don't understand why there's just so much talk still about women being marginalized in construction. I feel like they're equal and people say that to me, men say that to me. And um, I think this report can do so much good to help get that message out. Yes. And that was that was really what our intention was to try to highlight this. Um, you know, it's. Um, I would imagine that it's difficult if you're on a project site and, and you're in a, you know, you're in a minority population. In this case, if you're a, a woman, you know, well, I don't want to speak up because these people all have different experiences than me. And, you know, when I share, um, it's, it's not the same thing as, as, as what they, um, as what they might experience. So they may discount it or, or not understand it or whatever. Um, and that was what we were wanting to, to, to get through in, you know, in this work that we were doing is to try to, to highlight that so that it's a benefit, you know, the, the, some of the talks that we've, that we've given here is, you know, the construction industry has paid uh, at a minimum, they've paid a great deal of lift service over the past, I'll just throw out 20 years to getting women more involved in the construction industry. Uh, and not only lip service, I think they've invested resources in 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 looking to to do that too. But the numbers show that it's not it's not a, it's not it's not it's not working like they want it to do. So you know, we tried to approach this from a isn't um, people are frustrated about it, like what you're talking about, you know, with you know not, not only are the women, if you're a if you're a, a male executive in one of these companies and you've been trying to increase the representation of of women, uh, in large part, it hasn't been effective. And, you know, that's frustrating to be right. trying to do something, whatever it is, and it's not working. So what we're trying to do is go in and say, hey, here's some here's some things that you can do. Um, you know, here's some ideas that you can go through and start to implement uh, to try to, you know, make this thing that that you say that you want to do. And I, and I believe most most of them do. Uh, I, I think they do want to uh, make it happen. Uh, yeah. It's just that they haven't been effective uh, in in doing it. You know, effort. Uh, you know, maybe um, expending effort without it being really good and targeted effort. Yeah, I think I think the people, the companies that are reaching out for the information, looking for that research, looking for the reports, they they are interested in making a difference and increasing the the female uh, workforce. Uh, one thing that we talked about before we started recording was, you know, what people get this report um, and we'll have links in the show notes so that people can access this report. And I think another one that you sent me as well. Um, but this is great information for them to read. But I think at some point people are going to look at it. And go, okay. Okay. I get it. But how can I make it better? And that's when consultants like myself get involved in, 
I, I can come in with my 30 years of experience and say, okay, let's, let's evaluate your company. Let's see what's going on, where you'd like it to be different, and let's start putting things in place. But although you guys don't offer that service directly and there are consultants that do, you guys do offer a lot of services through uh, NCCER. What, give the listeners an idea of what kind of services you do offer that are improving the industry and increasing the number of people coming into it. Sure. Uh, so the first one I'll, I'll talk about uh, is one that we've had going for quite a while and it's called Build Your Future. Uh, so if you go to, to byf.org, uh, this is really our outreach uh, program to try to uh, educate people about the construction industry and the opportunities that uh, that uh, are available uh, within that industry. And so if you're looking at trying to reach out to young people to talk to them about construction, there's resources on that. If, if you're a, a company that you get invited to go uh, speak to a local um, high school at their career fair, um, about construction, we have resources in there to talk about, you know, what do the different trades do? You know, what what salaries do they earn? How does somebody get into the construction industry? Um, so there's links uh, and materials that are available there to educators as well, uh, if you're looking at highlighting that. So, you know, that program is 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 set up to um, uh, set up to provide that information. Uh, the other uh, the other area that we um, provide resources for is a program that's called Career Starter, which is really looking at linking um, people that are coming out of uh, the construction uh, coming out of a construction training program. Uh, so you know you're 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 finishing you know you're at a community college or a high school and you're finishing you know a level one uh, carpenter program and you want to you know get a job. Uh, we've got a website available where companies will post their entry level jobs on there where they're looking for a carpenter and where it's at. And so we're really looking at linking those people up. So if you're a company, uh, you know, and you're just wanting to, to, to help bring folks new into the industry, we've got that resource for you to go on, put your company information on and, and um, start attracting those people. If you're an educator, we have that program as well. Um, you know, the other, the other um, service that we provide uh, that is really our core business, and you know, it seems a bit, um, it seems a bit like a, you know, uh, almost like a common sense approach to the problem. But you know, we provide um, tools and resources to help train construction craft workers, and that's something that our industry desperately needs now across the board. Um, but it is particularly true if you're trying to attract women into the construction industry. So if I just speak in generalities, um, if you're if you're growing up, I have a I have a son and a daughter. Um, if something breaks on our truck, on our tractor, something on the house, uh, just from a societal standpoint, it's generally my son uh, that's going to get pulled in to to help fix that. I know with me and my sister, I was the one that was uh, that was doing that. So I was exposed to construction type work uh, at an earlier age, uh, just because of you know what society how how that sort of works. So that continues if you look into enrollment in construction career and technical education programs. The enrollment of women in those programs is is ten or twenty percent. Um, so that's you know significantly less than than men uh, enrolled in those programs. So if I'm a contractor and you uh, you read our report and you say, you know what, this makes a lot of sense. I see the unique skills and abilities that women bring. Uh, I want to go bring some women into my workforce. If you go out and try to find a, a woman electrician, a woman carpenter, uh, you know, a woman pipe fitter, I gave you the statistics at the beginning of this this podcast. They're they're four percent, you know. So uh, that's that's kind of hard to do. But what if you said, you know what? I want to go find a woman who is interested in this work. I want to find a woman who is hardworking, uh, who's passionate, who's willing to learn, and I am willing to provide the resources to train her. Now, suddenly, that's a much more achievable problem to see. And so within our focus groups, when we ask the women, you know, how did you get into the construction industry? You know, many of them had a family background in it, and that drags people in. But the other one that came up was that they had a friend who was working in the construction industry and she heard what her friend was making and she's sitting here saying, I'm working two jobs and I'm not even making that. Let me get a job with your company. And so they come in at a job 
um, where they are working in the tool room or they're on the custodial staff or they're driving, you know, the crew bus around. And, you know, we heard over and over again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm walking around this job site and I see this amazing thing that we're building. And I'm wondering, I, I think I could do that. And it happens to be that the company that I work for from day one has said, if you will go complete these training modules, if you'll go take these classes and pass these tests that we will provide to you free of charge, here is how your sal your hourly wage will increase once you complete that training. And so that provided a way in uh, to the industry, and then they facilitated those those training facilities. And so we as an organization are constantly working uh, to make construction craft training more accessible uh, to to everyone while still maintaining a a high um, a high skill level. Well, and I think in general, it's important for people to remember that or to know if they don't know, um, men tend to jump into things they don't have experience with with less hesitation than women when women go you know get invited to go do or try something they feel like they needed to have experience with it before they do it um when i started you know right out of college and i went you know to my first day on the job i i was like i do not know what i'm i figured everyone that was my competition coming out of school as well had way more construction experience than I did. I was so nervous about that. Um, but it, having these programs that help women develop and understand the need for the skills so that they can be confident to jump into those roles, I think is so important that you guys are doing. There's one thing, though, I would like to change um, about a, a, a statement that you made, and I'm not critiquing your statement. It just hit me in a way that I thought, I, I want to say this. You um, you said looking for women who are interested in this kind of work. And I think that so many people think that, and that's what they're looking for. And I think as an industry, a mind shift is saying, a woman who may be interested in this work because there's so many, I mean, like, just like you said, a woman who's, um, I've got an interview coming up with a woman, Corey Fisk in the future. And part of her story is she started out as, as a flag person and she's like watching all the other work that's going on. And like, I want to go do that instead, but she didn't know she'd be interested in it. And so we, we've we got to look at all women as women who may be interested and educate them and inform them. And then to the training that you guys are offering, which is fantastic to, to bring them and, and anyone, not just women, but anyone in. I think that there's just not enough information. And I think so many times when people first walk on a job site, they're like, okay, this is cool. Like, what can I do? And we need yeah. to get that out there. Yeah, I I, I appreciate you pointing that out because I, I agree 100%. You know, I, I always say, um, if you go up to Dearborn, Michigan, uh, where Ford builds the F-150, mm -hmm. uh, they have a tour set up uh, for you to, 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 to go through and do that plant that is 100% a marketing uh, experience. You know, you walk through, they show everything, they get you really excited about the cool stuff that we're doing. Um, I visited the Boeing plant down in South Carolina, uh, you know, where they're building the triple sevens, you know, carbon fiber. They've got that factory set up to where you can walk through it and look down and tour guides and see everything that's going on with that. What's the first thing that we do when we start a construction site? We put up a fence. And then now, not only do we put the fence up, we put a screen on the fence so that you can't see in right. uh, the, the fence. And, you know, it's the exact opposite. Like you said, so my, my wife teaches in the College of Pharmacy and they were building a, a brand new building next to her building. And I used to get text messages during the day from, from her coworkers who would stand there at, you know, on their third or fourth floor uh, third or fourth floor building, looking out the window, watching what was going on at the construction site and just fascinated by it. I'd get a picture. What are they doing here? You know, how do they know how to do that? What's, you know, what's this process here for what's going on? And like you said, when you get people in there and engaged, um, it's a, 
it, it really sparks that interest. And if you, you know, I've got younger kids when they were in, um, when they were in their daycare program, what kind of toys are they playing with? They're playing with trucks and blocks and it's the boys and the girls are playing with that. Yeah. So, you know, at some point we tell them, no, 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 put that away. It's time to do other things now um, versus keeping that alive. So I really appreciate you pointing that out because that's, that's true. Whether you decide to not work in the construction industry or not, I, I don't see how anybody could not find a construction site fascinating. I know. I can't. The, those aren't real people. Like, I don't understand those kind of people. <laughs> Tim, I have really enjoyed this conversation today, and I am so glad that you took the time to sit down with me and have this conversation to share with the listeners. Um, is there anything you want to end on in particular? No, it would just be to, um, you know, encourage folks to go, uh, I hate to sound cliche, but download the report. Um, if this is an issue that you are um, interested in, but you really don't know where to begin, uh, I think the work that we've done really helps give a grounding and a foundation there. Uh, this can be intimidating, uh, especially in the current environment. Um, we might be afraid, you know, to 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 look and, and broach at some of these issues. But what we saw from the women in our focus group is that, you know, transparency on this topic goes a long way and, you know, a willingness to learn and, you know, to understand that if, if, you know, if this is a hard, this is a complex problem to solve. I don't want to say it's a complex problem to solve. If the solution to this was one silver bullet that we just flipped the switch, it would have happened already. Mm -hmm. um, but I do believe that the solutions to it are having an open, open and honest dialogue and, and learning to, to, to take place. And, you know, it can be difficult to go out if you've got, um, you know, one um, woman who's a craft worker with your company to go ask her for her experience. You know, that kind of puts her on the spot and is maybe, um, you know, you know, difficult for her to answer. That's why we wanted to pull all this together, package it in a report to provide insight. Um, so, you know, I think going out and doing that, being transparent about, you know, what you're trying to do. I think if more companies do that, um, they'll have greater success rather than trying to sort of have the glossy marketing material uh, to maybe try to build an image that's not there. Yeah, and um, I'll tag on that real quick. With companies wanting to do their own research, totally, I totally appreciate that. And the company that I worked for for 20 years, they did, they did some of that, not necessarily women related, but just in general, like how are things going? And when they would send out those surveys, they would ask qualifying factors so that they could kind of group who's saying what, but not know people in particular. And as one of the few women in the field, if I had put my age range, and if I had put um, that I worked in the field, and if I had put what position, I was the only person that fit all of those categories. So at that point, I would stop filling out the survey because I did not feel that I could be honest. And so Think about those things when you are sending things out within your own companies, talking to the listeners now, that you, you, you can't overqualify to a level that someone's going to stop participating with their feedback and instead use companies like or organizations like NCCER to help gather the data that you're wanting and then use some consultants to come in and help you actually make those changes in your organization. So Dittoing what, dittoing, is that a word? Here I am making up words again. Uh, dittoing what Tim said, go download the report. And if you are not the top executive in your company, please forward it or hand it, print it and hand it to the top executive in your company and start making some changes as soon as you can. If you know someone that could benefit from this particular episode, then share it with them. Or if you want to continue to learn about the untapped and underutilized resources that will take your business to the next level, then follow the podcast. You don't want to miss an episode where we discuss what you needed to hear. And lastly, there is a link in the show notes that will allow you to reach out to me directly if you want to accelerate that learning curve. Thanks for listening. Talk soon.